Now, um, please stand want... by. Good day and welcome to the Working with Fathers After Incarceration Tips from Research and Practice webinar. As a reminder, today's conference is being recorded. At this time, I would like to turn the conference over to Nigel Van. Please go ahead, sir. Thank you very much and welcome to our, um, our latest National Responsible Fatherhood Clearinghouse webinar. Um, as you see, today's topic is working with fathers after incarceration. Um, if you've tuned in, I'm expecting to hear the voice of um, Kenneth Braswell, our director. I'm, I'm very sorry that he couldn't make it today. He had a, um, a conflict with um, another um, appointment. Um, so you, you've got me as usual, I'm afraid. But um, I think we've got a, a great slate of presenters for you today. So let me just quickly walk you through what you're seeing on your screens. And then we're actually going to show you a short video. Um, so as usual, um, this webinar is being recorded, and um, a few weeks after the webinar, please come back to um, our website at fatherhood.gov backslash webinars, and you'll be able to hear the recording and see a transcript and, and all the presentation materials. If you want to download the presentation materials today, you can see in the downloadable resources box, um, we have um, some Urban Institute research reports that our first presenter is going to be drawing on. You have a bio for each of the presenters. You have our helpful resources if you want to get more information on the topic. And you can also download a PDF of today's slides. And I see that you've all found our chat box and are saying hello to each other. And we certainly encourage you to share information in there. If you have a question for the presenters, um, please put it in the Ask a Question box in the bottom right-hand corner. And then we'll ask as many of those questions um, at the end as we can. And as usual, if we don't have time for all the questions, we do post um, replies to other questions online when we post the other materials. And in the bottom left-hand corner, you can see various web links for the Clearinghouse and each of the organizations that are joining us today. Um, so let me see here. I'll move us here. I'm going to give you a quick overview of the clearinghouse, and then I'm going to we're just going to show you a quick little video um, in case you haven't seen it. So for those of you who are joining us for the first time, um, the National Responsible Father Clearinghouse is funded by the Office of Family Assistance, and um, John Allen of the Office of Family Assistance will um, join us. He's, he's on the call now, but he'll join us at the end of the webinar just to share a few words. And we provide resources for fathers, father programs, researchers, and policymakers. You can find us at fatherhood.gov if you haven't been on our website before. You can download our toolkit. You can go to the webinars link for to see information on all the webinars we've done since 2008. And you can contact us um, on that help at fatherhood.gov.info email line. And we always encourage you to let fathers and other practitioners know about our national call center, which you can call toll-free at 1-877-4DAD-411. And um, one of the things we do, well, let me also draw your attention to um, an upcoming national conference that the Office of Family Assistance is putting on in conjunction with the National Responsible Fatherhood Clearing House. Um, if you haven't received information on this yet, it's going to be in Nashville, Tennessee, June the 4th to 6th. And we will be supplying more registration information very soon. So now, um, if Enzo, if you could pull up this short video. The, the video you're about to see is um, it's our latest um, PSA from the Ad Council. And um, it's quite, um, quite a touching video in terms of um, dads and daughters. Hopefully this won't take too long to come up. If it does, we'll skip it. Here we go. I don't remember how it started. Oh. Our back and forth. Victory. 
fumble. Repeat. It always came back. <laughs> You probably don't remember what you told me. That was perfect. But I heard every word. Nice. Okay, well, I hope you enjoyed that, and um, I, I hope there's a few teary eyes in the room, but that, that's one of my favorite um, PSAs that we've had in um, the recent past. So you can catch those on various um, programs on the, on the TV. You'll hear radio ads as well. Um, so um, anyway, without further ado, let me um, move us forward to the, the heart of our um, conversation today. So you're going to be hearing today from um, three um, very experienced presenters. We have um, Dr. Jocelyn Fontaine from the Urban Institute. We have um, Darren Goff, who works with the Strengthening Families Program in Washington State. Um, this is an um, Office of Family Assistance um, grant program funded to, to the to the Washington Department of Corrections. And um, also we have Mr. Daim Knight from the Family Reentry Program in Bridgeport, Connecticut. And as you'll see, when we get to the discussion session, we're actually going to be joined by two fathers. Um, we have um, um, Robert Duggins from the Strength in Families Program, and, and we were going to have um, Don Trey Crawford from the Family Reentry Program. And unfortunately, Don Trey can't join us today, but we do have another father who's actually going to be calling in in about half an hour from his workplace, I believe, and his name is um, Geraldo Hernandez. So we'll be hearing from Geraldo and Robert um, when we get to that um, um, discussion session. So if you have questions for the fathers, please feel free to put those in as well. Um, with that, I'm going to ask Enzo to bring up our first poll question. And we'll do that, and then I will introduce um, Jocelyn, and we'll get going. So if you could just um, briefly tell us which of the following best describes your experience working with fathers who have been incarcerated. This is just to let the presenters have a sense of who's on the line. You know, it's a, a little bit tricky as a presenter sometimes. We, we don't know who we're actually talking to. It's not like being in person. This helps us just a tad to understand that. And at the moment, it looks like um, the largest response so far as I work with fathers, some have been incarcerated, but most have not. I think I'd have probably put money on that one being the top one if it, I had before. But yeah, and then um, there, there's a good number also working with fathers, working mainly with fathers who are returning to the community, and about an equal number who work mainly with children and families. And so that's very interesting because that's incredibly important work. OK, Enzo, well, thank you very much. Thanks for your responses there. And now let me introduce um, Jocelyn. Um, Jocelyn, um, as I said, is a, is a senior research fellow at the um, Justice Policy Center for the Urban Institute. She's also an adjunct assistant professor at the McCourt School of Public Policy at Georgetown University. Her research focuses on the evaluation of community-based crime reduction and re-entry initiatives. As she directs projects using quantitative and qualitative research methodologies with the goal of exploring the impact of community-based initiatives for individuals, families, and communities. Before joining the Urban Institute, um, she worked on the Pew Charitable Trust's public safety performance project and on violence and victimization issues for the Office of Research and Evaluation at the National Institute of Justice, which is part of the um, United States Department of Justice. Um, so with that, I will give the time to Jocelyn. You can read her full bio and everybody else's if you download the presenter bios. Jocelyn, the time is yours. Thank you very much for that, Nigel. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to participate in this webinar and share um, both what I and my colleagues have learned about working with fathers after incarceration and the importance of family-focused reentry services. I believe there's going to be a resource guide um, that will be provided, which will provide much more detail than I'm able to uh, during my brief remarks, and I encourage you all to 
consult those resources, not only things that the Urban Institute has written, but the broader field that's focused on these issues, and um, reach out if you have any questions, either in this webinar or otherwise. Um, so my presentation is guided by three main points. The first of which is on this first slide is that there's a growing body of research that supports the importance of family-focused practices for incarcerated fathers. This includes practices and services that can be implemented during incarceration, and incarceration I'm including prisons and jails, and also practices and services that can be administered in the immediate months or days and months that are following uh, uh, release from incarceration, otherwise known as the reentry period. Uh, However, and this is my second point, uh, implementing family-focused practices in both correctional settings and community settings can be difficult for a myriad of reasons, some of which I'll cover in a minute. Um, and third is that there is limited research that points to specific best practices in this space, um, which can be frustrating to some who are looking for specific curriculum or models, yet there are plenty of lessons on promising approaches uh, that I'll talk about. Uh, so let's get into this in a little bit more detail. Um, as many of you know, the statistics here are startling. Uh, there's approximately 2.7 million children um, that have a parent currently serving time in a correctional facility, and that more than 5 million children have experienced parental incarceration in their lifetime. This, of course, is due to the large number of adults that are incarcerated in our country. And further, since we know that incarceration has a disproportionate impact on some groups and some communities, we know too that parental incarceration has a disproportionate impact on children and families with lower incomes and black and brown children. Parental incarceration is stressful and traumatic for children, and depending on their unique personal and family circumstances can either contribute or create economic, residential, and social disruptions for children. The period of incarceration can severely uh, limit or inhibit parents' abilities to fulfill their familial responsibilities. Uh, during incarceration, father-child and father-family communication, contact, and engagement is difficult for several key reasons. Uh, what I've offered here is um, a list of some of the key reasons why contact and communication can be difficult during incarceration, but this list is not meant to be exhaustive, uh, since we know that incarceration has a number of um, pretty significant consequences on children and families. Um, but what we've learned through our studies of families and discussions with various stakeholders is that communication, contact, and engagement can be difficult due to uh, the correctional policies and practices that govern contact and communication, such as visiting policies and procedures that govern phone use, for example. The distance of facilities um, from where minor children and their families and caregivers live can limit contact because it's really far. We also know that phone calls and in-person visits can be cost prohibitive to many families, which reduces their ability to engage with their family members during incarceration. There's also feelings of shame and fear among incarcerated parents, their children, and their caregivers, which can limit contact. Uh, for example, some incarcerated parents feel shame in having their children and family members visit them while they're incarcerated, and we know that children and caregivers can also be fearful of coming into correctional facilities, since as is uh, obvious, uh, correctional institutions are not known for being family friendly, um, and this is including facilities that really try to be more inviting uh, to children and families. They still are places that um, are often um, can uh, be fearful for children and families to come into. There's also feelings of frustration, confusion, and anxiety navigating correctional institutions and their policies, such as how to get to and around the physical plant, uh, the practices and policies that govern contact and communication. Um, some policies and practices lack transparency in some instances, such as why are certain colors or clothes that can't be worn or come into the facility. Uh, and this can be very confusing and frustrating for children and families and therefore hinder uh, contact and communication between incarcerated parents and their loved ones. Um, in many ways, uh, children and families are the hidden victims of incarceration. I think that this is changing, which is nice to see, um, but they still receive uh, not nearly enough attention that they should. Um, parental incarceration, again, depending on the personal and family circumstances, can have adverse impact on families through lost wages, uh, the need to change residence, or changes in caregiver arrangements or daily routines. It can also challenge healthy family functioning. It can also cause the loss of emotional and financial support for intimate partners, 
co-parents, caregivers, and other family members. And generally, the point that I'm trying to make is that both children and family units are impacted by incarceration when they lose, when they lose a loved one to incarceration. And therefore, interventions and practices that are focused on families, rooted in the role and importance of families, cognizant of the children and families that, um, of incarcerated per, uh, persons, um, uh, interventions and practices have tremendous potential. They can repair and strengthen the relationship between children, families, and incarcerated individuals. They have the potential to mitigate the potentially harmful consequences of incarceration on families. And they can also facilitate the successful reentry of formerly incarcerated fathers once they return into the community. So based on all of this, um, I am a strong advocate for recognizing that families should be viewed as partners or as stakeholders in the reentry process. Uh, they can make reentry programming more or less successful the extent to which families are engaged and included as partners. And here, I'm referring or potentially advocating for a broad definition of family, where family includes the biological family members and children that I've mentioned, um, you know, parents, siblings, romantic partners, but it can also include an individual's broader social support network that may include mentors, the faith community, and other friends. Um, family in context is important, whether narrowly or broadly defined, and program staff that are working with fathers who are in the community uh, must have a realistic assessment of an individual's family and social support network, um, since family can really strengthen or undermine individuals' reentry. Um, a program that uh, engage, includes family and engages family as partners can include various different types of strategies, such as engaging families in the program planning process, understanding how programming can support the family unit, such as understanding how the timing, the location, or the types of program activities support the family. It can also include allowing family members to participate in some of the program activities and benefit from those activities directly, such as inviting family members to program activities or events or providing limited um, case management services directly to family members. Uh, it can also include leveraging family support for the individual, so using family support as a way to kind of get uh, the formerly incarcerated person more engaged into services, using the family potentially as a hook in that way. Um, and family members can also be an ally to program staff, helping keep the formerly incarcerated person on track, keeping them engaged. Uh, the family member can also be a person for the program staff to call if they're concerned where the returning person is, where, they're, where they are, and whether they're staying on track. Um, overall, it's really critical to be thoughtful about family engagement and thinking about families as stakeholders and as partners, um, again, due to the central role that families play in the reentry process. Um, since many of you are already working with fathers uh, who have experienced incarceration, a lot of this is, not, is, uh, is well known to you. But as an overview, um, upon return to the community, um, incarcerated persons rely uh, uh, pretty significantly on their family members for emotional and material support when they come home. And this is in particular in the immediate months um, post-release. We know that families provide a ton of resources. Housing is one of them. And this is in despite their own resource limitations and service needs. Uh, the reentry population often comes back uh, to the community um, from incarceration with a range of needs, um, and this varies by person, but the key ones are uh, housing, employment, education, skill building services. There's also the need for mental health and substance abuse treatment, and then more basic or elemental needs such as identification, transportation, clothing, and food. Um, these services and needs are critical for a number of reasons, not least of which is due to their relationship to reentry success, that is, in uh, keeping people um, uh, from returning to incarceration. And we know that uh, the ability um, to tap into family, to engage, in fam to engage with family and family support is also related to reentry success. So putting this all together um, in a very short amount of time, hoping that I've um, laid out for you why all of this is important. Um, so here are just a, a very brief overview of some of the promising practices that we've seen, heard about, and read about uh, that can support families and improve both parent-child contact and um, parent-family contact and communication during incarceration and in the community. Um, 
These are some of the practices that can be implemented or conducted by both government agencies, such as sheriff's departments, jails, state departments of corrections, as well as community-based service providing organizations who work jointly with or for those government agencies. Um, some of the services that can be provided during incarceration, which I've listed to the left here of your slide, include uh, coach telephone calls between parents and their children and family members, contact visits with family members, parenting relationship training and education and curriculum, and family activity days where family can come into the facility and enjoy spending time with their incarcerated family members and engage in activities such as arts and crafts, family photos, or holiday parties. In the community, some of the things that we've seen are practitioners helping caregivers and returning parents with child care services, uh, assistance with modifying child support um, arrangements, um, uh, reducing uh, child support uh, obligations, um, offering family-focused case management services, and hosting support groups for returning parents, co-parents, and caregivers. Um, I also want to mention that employment services are also super helpful uh, for um, uh, formerly incarcerated persons and something that supports the entire family. Um, you know, when the incarcerated parent uh, is, is, is getting uh, income and, and working on uh, employment, then they're better able to support uh, their family members as well. With these practices in mind, um, there's a couple of considerations uh, that I'd also like uh, for folks to know about. Uh, the first is that um, it's important to point out that there is, despite um, the promise of these practices, um, and that a lot of these are, um, quite frankly, just no-brainers, um, uh, we have a lack of evidence about which practices have meaningful impact on parents, family members, and children um, that are involved in or affected by the practice. So there haven't been nearly enough rigorous evaluations of many of these practices for us to label them, quote, evidence-based or best practices. Um, we also know that families are complex and that not one practice um, that works for or is responsive to one family may work with all others. It's also important to mention that the impact of a practice may be different depending on whether the focus is on the child, the family, or the incarcerated or formerly incarcerated adult outcome. Um, just one key example is that um, we know that parent-child visitation has generally been shown to improve parents' behavior in jails and prisons, but there's some research that indicates that visitation might be um, uh, negative uh, for children who are experiencing it. Another consideration um, which can challenge the implementation of some of these activities is that practices need adequate space, resources, and funding. And so again, while these things are, are, are no-brainers or, or sound um, pretty easy to implement, they can be difficult depending on um, resources and space uh, both in institutions and in community-based settings. Another consideration is how to generate uh, buy-in um, and potentially needing to change the culture among staff to support some of these services or activities. Um, we found that this can be a case with some correctional facilities not being as open uh, to family-friendly uh, or family-focused practices. Um, and a final thing to mention is that uh, implementing a new practice in pre-release versus post-release settings can present different advantages and drawbacks. And so, for example, in pre-release settings or in correctional institutions, it's much easier to recruit parents into programming uh, and support them in activities and keep them engaged. Um, but it can be difficult in those settings to incorporate co-parents, caregivers, and children due to security clearances and other concerns. Um, conversely, um, post-release community settings can make it easier for formerly incarcerated parents and their co-parents um, and families and children to participate in classes, activities, and to learn, support, and engage with one another. But it can be much harder to maintain program engagement because of work, super, supervision requirements, or other time constraints uh, that may take precedent over voluntary services. The last uh, slide here is just some other considerations is that um, programs uh, need to be flexible in meeting families where they are, um, recognizing that families are unique um, and that what is responsive to some may not be responsive to others. It's also important to adapt to the changing needs of participants and family, knowing that their needs often change um, one in the community, or sorry, in the correctional setting versus the community setting, and then once formerly incarcerated persons are in the community and have reintegrated their, their needs and interests uh, may change over time. 
um, it's important to build effective partnerships. So the very um, uh, uh, quick overview that I gave of both uh, correctional practice, practices that can be implemented in correctional settings and those can be implemented in community settings um, really require partnerships. Um, no one uh, sort of um, uh, agency can do it alone and at minimum it usually requires a partnership between a correctional facility and a community, a community program. And so it's important that there's effective um, responses and um, partnerships um, that can enable those practices to be successful. Um, I've already mentioned it's important uh, if a program can both leverage um, the opportunities that are present in institutional versus community settings and use those things to build on one another. Um, and finally, uh, it's important to be collaborative, to work with uh, community partners and as necessary making uh, mid-course corrections if things aren't working uh, over time. Thank you. Thank you, Jocelyn. That was um, a tremendous presentation of an awful lot of information um, and very succinctly put there. Um, a lot of pearls of wisdom in there. Um, for those of you who want to read more of Jocelyn's work, and there's a lot of it, um, you can download the Urban Institute um, research reports that um, is in the downloadable um, resources document. I also wanted to draw your attention um, on the helpful resources document, uh, there's a helpful resources document and the Urban Institute um, one. On the um, helpful resources document, as we're calling it, we've got um, various resources there, including some Urban Institute ones. Um, I wanted to draw your attention to a couple of ones from the, the clearinghouse, actually. Um, we, we had a couple of blogs last year in July and August that were dealing with this topic and you can also go to our toolkit um, there's a section in the toolkit um, for practitioners on working with um, incarcerated fathers so with that I'm going to introduce um, Mr. Darren Goff from the Department of um, Corrections in Washington State um, Darren is a program manager there as I mentioned before with the Strengthening Families program which is a um, Office of Family Assistance grantee Darren has been with the Department of Corrections in Washington for 30 years. Um, in that time, he supervised a wide range of departments and programs and developed several reentry and family reunification programs. Um, he has been with the um, Department Strengthening Families program since October 2016 and has been the program manager of that program since last October. And um, prior to um, this position, you know, as part of his work at, at the state, he, um, he, he worked at the, at the Washington Correction Center for, for Women for 13 years and the Monroe Correctional Complex for 15 years. So um, it's interesting that he started out doing more work with mothers um, and is now more focused on fathers. Um, and also a very interesting thing for me at least, um, as you'll see in his bio, um, Darren has also worked as a professional climbing guide and led expeditions to some of the world's largest mountains. So quite a man, Mr. Goff. Um, so we're, we're going to have a video of Darren's program. So first of all, Darren, would, would you like just to um, introduce the video that we're going to see? Sure. Um, we're uh, actually sitting here right now at the same facility it was shot at. Um, and we just kind of wanted, we, we, you know, we have a lot of audiences that we want to speak to about our program and uh, it's just not everybody that actually can get inside of the walls of a prison and really um, kind of where the rubber hits the road with the guys that we're working with day to day. Um, I just kind of think that it gives uh, a little more context to, uh, to what we're doing. It is about uh, a year or so old, a year and a half, and we're going to do a second version of this this spring where um, we're going to um, at this point in the program, be able to um, uh, be interviewing some some fathers who've been released and uh, their family members. So, um, so whenever you're ready, Nigel. Okay, here we go. First time I see my daughters in here, uh, I cry like a baby. <laughs> That's one of one of my main motivators was knowing that who she feels her attracted to or what she pulls into her life will depend on who I am as a man. What makes it work the best was the way we came in and we were open with each other. 
And so we have to lean on each other. There's guys that have support and there's guys that don't have support. It's allowed for us to teach each other. The Strength in Families program is new. It's um, funded through the Department of Health and Human Services um, reentry grant called Responsible Fatherhood Opportunities for Reentry and Mobility. Um, so in short, that's the reform grant, and with that funding, we've launched into the implementation of the Strength in Families program. There are three primary areas that we focus on in the Strength in Families program. One is positive parenting. The second is healthy relationships, whether that's with a co-parent or a partner. And then the third is economic stability as well as mobility. Particularly in here, it reminds them that they are a person and that they are a human being and that they're not broken. And so that, again, empowers them to take control over their life or start leading their life in a better direction. But the purpose of the program isn't necessarily to glue families back together again. Safety is absolutely critical and the safety and the well-being of kids and co-parents is at the forefront of what we're considering as we're implementing the program. These are all of these guys that are now trying to be good men, trying to be good fathers. And so I see that growth in them, and I also see that they can continue to grow. I see that there's still more growth to be done, but I see that they're ready for it. I feel relieved. Um, nervous. I feel scared and excited at the same time and anxious. But about my release, the number one feeling I feel is uh, ready. Okay, well, thank you very much for sharing that video with us, Darren. And um, as I mentioned before, we, we will be hearing from one of the fathers um, in that program, um, Mr. Robert Duggins, um, later on. But um, now let me give the mic back to Darren and um, take it away, Darren. Yeah, so thanks, Nigel. Appreciate that. Um, I think it was mentioned earlier, we are uh, a uh, OFA grantee. Um, the initial part of our program was um, just kind of the build-up, but it is community-centered program, um, which means we lean heavily on community partners, and the skill base is both pre- and post-release. Uh, generally speaking, we start with the classes in here, which um, help develop um, father-child engagement skills uh, and um, just healthy partnerships. Uh, with um, with any family member, and then we work to uh, increase education and employment opportunities. Where the ultimate vision is, so any of our fathers can just go live safely at home and have a positive relationship um, with their family members and their kids. Whatever that looks like, it may not mean that it's going to look like a white picket fence for everybody, but we're going to try to um, give them skills and, and help them along the way. Um, part of you know, the difficulty sometimes um, in prison is just kind of building the nature of the program. I want to just take a quick minute to talk about we're here at Shelton in the state of Washington. All of our, all of our counties, um, any sentencing that goes on, come, they all come through the reception center here at Shelton before the classification process begins. So to get guys into the program, it's sometimes uh, a lot of competition for court-mandated programming, for the Department of Corrections has other mandated programming. So the screening process, just getting guys in can sometimes um, be cumbersome uh, and, of course, meeting all the criteria of, of the grant. Uh, but the transition planning actually begins um, really right from the get-go. Um, our first uh, kind of uh, you know, interaction with the guys, we like to target them being about six to nine months out so we can fit all the classes in. 
Um, and again, mention some of the partners that we have. Um, we we uh, engage immediately with uh, sometimes if they want with alternative solutions. That is a uh, it's a division of um, child support to see if they have any child support that they need help with. We can help with that. Um, we also contract with Shepherd and Associates, so any of their own situations which they might want to talk to a professional counselor about or their families or their kids. Um, so kind of boots on the ground actually working uh, with those things on the outside even before um, they're, they're at the door. So um, video visits, I think um, visiting is a big deal. Not all of our facilities are located close to urban areas or where our participants live. So it really, uh, getting them paid video visits is a really big deal for some of the guys that have a tough time getting family members uh, down to visit. Um, <clears throat> our case uh, manager and navigation and navigators help, um, uh, sorry, I lost my place. Um, they help get access to the key services um, really from the get-go. Our, our, our uh, case managers try to sit down and meet with the participants in a strength-based approach and find out what their actual you know, needs are and work with the partners in the community before they're ever, ever out. Um, the curriculum that we use, um, we have two curriculum. Parenting Inside Out uh, is a, was developed in the state of Oregon for their Department of Corrections. Uh, we use it as a, we, we don't teach guys how to parent. Um, we give them the skills and they decide what skills work best for their own family and for their own parenting style. Walking the Line is a, it is a, a communication class really. It teaches, I think one of the main things it teaches is how to understand yourself and how you relate to, to individuals. Job readiness. Um, typically we've utilized our community colleges for this piece, but they're phasing that out in Washington Department of Corrections. So um, we're actually putting in a, a, a supplemental um, class to be able to, to take on this part. Um, but our navigators, not only do they come in and work with guys on resumes, cover letters, really assisting them to try to find their strengths and their skills, give them information on what's going on out there with um, the labor market. Uh, but sometimes, you know, these guys just need somebody to believe in them. A lot of times they just haven't had anybody uh, that's believed in them. They come and they say, you know, well, I don't have any job skills. All they ever did was sell drugs. It's like, well, Let's step back and take a look at it. And um, sometimes, you know, uh, even illegal activity uh, cultivates uh, things that can be transferable into a legal, uh, legal career. And so we try to take a look at what they have, work with them, uh, get them connected when they get out uh, into the community. So our case managers, um, one of the things about our case managers I think is important to note is hiring the right people. Um, you know, corrections, sometimes the culture in uh, corrections can not be the friendliest to uh, reentry, the reentry process. Um, so I think hiring people who understand that process, at least initially, to get some credibility for the program inside different facilities is important. But to be able to, you know, sit down and not be judgmental and listen to somebody's story um, and build rapport with them from early on is really, really critical. Uh, and then I think the culture of those classrooms are important as well to be able to be led by an instructor uh, where guys aren't afraid to talk about some of their issues and then you bring in a case manager who um, can, can really start to work on some issues uh, out there, whether it's a family situation or job or whatever it is, even while the guys are still incarcerated, um, so that the same person that they're dealing with inside uh, the facility is working with their family in their own unique situations on the outside. But it's definitely, you know, not a one-size-fits-all approach. Um, so the role of the education employment navigator is, uh, I kind of said earlier, it's evolved a little bit since the beginning, since um, we don't necessarily have the classes that our community colleges were providing when we first began. 
it's important that we get uh, all of our participants prepared with uh, a resume and prepared to do job searches, but this position spends a lot of time in the community cultivating relationships with work source, with, um, I mean, just, you know, labor unions, uh, all the things that, that, that were pretty broad, so we're five counties, it's a, a lot of ground to cover, um, so relationships in those areas are just huge for us to be able to uh, get guys help when they get out in the community. Our goal really is to have them be confident, be prepared, um, to have a resume, and to have some, some idea what they're going to do when they, they get out. Um, but we also, you know, um, we don't pretend to know everything, so we like to bring in specialists. We bring in people who, uh, uh, from labor unions, we be, bring in people from uh, employment security or work source. We bring in a lot of different people into our facilities over the course of the, the time prior to release to where they can uh, help um, uh, give, give knowledge to our participants. So again, I mean, continuing on with the role of education employment navigators, um, it's just a big piece of, of what we do. Uh, the timing of guys getting out, um, you know, generally we like to have them complete their classes uh, and still have a few months prior to they get released, um, but the case management starts uh, right at around six months um, <clears throat> so we can pass these guys off um, fairly well prepared. Uh, so just kind of in closing, it's, it's, um, it's complicated, you know, uh, in what we do, it's complicated just in competing for uh, the right guys that are fathers and going to release to the counties and all the different, you know, mandated uh, programming that the courts present, but we're, we're starting to see um, a lot of results. I know we're going to have Mr. Duggins on here and he's going to talk about uh, what he's done in the program to this point, but um, it's, been, uh, it's been really fun. So, uh, Nigel? Thank you very much, Darren. And um, we're getting quite a few questions already, so both you and Jocelyn have um, definitely sparked some interest here, and I see quite a few people um, who are interested in the video, and you can see that we have posted the link to that in the chat box there. So if anyone wants to download that to show and view later, um, you can find it there. So um, now we're going to have, oh, and I, I did just want to say as well, one thing I've heard from both um, down and, and Jocelyn is just sort of how important it is that if you, you want to do this work effectively, you've got to start pre-release, but then also have those strong partnerships um, in the community to, to help guys as they as they do return. So let's pull up our second poll question, and then I'll introduce our third presenter. So if you could just tell us which of these you think is the biggest challenge um, faced by fathers as they come back from incarceration. Yeah, and you're, you're resoundingly going for the first one, finding a job with decent wages. The next, um, next highest one is um, not having a good support system. And um, I think as um, Jocelyn said in terms of one of hers, um, a lot of these things are no-brainers, but um, we did just want to get all your input on this. So, um, yeah, yeah, thank you very much. We'll, um, we'll close that now. And then... Um, let me um, introduce our final presenter. So um, I'm going to bring up um, Mr. Dai Mohammed McKnight, who's the program manager for the Young Fathers Reentry Program at the Family Reentry Organization in Bridgeport, Connecticut. Dai has been with Family Reentry for nine years, and he helps offenders prepare for successful reentry. On release, he connects them to community mentors who are themselves successful ex-offenders. He's also worked as a violence prevention coordinator for the YMCA, served as a mentor for ex-offenders and local youth, and coordinated gang awareness youth at-risk workshops. He is himself a former offender who served 17 years on a 25-year sentence, which means he's very familiar with the obstacles 
that offenders face on release. And I'm sure as um, really just from talking with him, I, I can see how he's been able to really connect with guys and help them on their journey. Before the webinar, he actually shared with me that um, at the time he became incarcerated, he actually had a young daughter and his, um, his wife partner was expecting their second child. Um, and he explained to me how that proved a catalyst for transition in his own life. Um, and so he's gone on from that to help many other young men make that same transition. So tell us all about it, Dai. Yes, good me? afternoon. Yeah. Yes, can you hear me? Good yeah, afternoon. You're clear. Okay. Uh, good afternoon to everyone, and it's an honor to be here to share some information that I hope may be useful to everyone. And I just want to salute all the other presenters for a fine job before talking about the information that we have before us. Um, presently at uh, Family Reentry, which is um, an organization uh, that provides uh, reentry services, fatherhood services, and services for children of incarcerated uh, parents, and services for um, people who uh, have been in the court system for intimate partner violence. Family Reentry began very small in 1984 as a reentry support group uh, at a men's halfway house in Bridgeport. Uh, the agency now provides intervention, reentry, and uh, other various family services in eight judicial districts, uh, two parole districts, and five and five prisons. Uh, four key points that Family Reentry operates under the premise of when working with uh, returning uh, citizens is uh, it's important for early uh, and long-term engagement and early engagement in terms of uh, pre-release as evidence-based uh, information research supports uh, the success of a successful reentry when the person is engaged six to 12 months prior to release. Uh, creative employment solutions, creating those relationships with the private sector, uh, mentoring support uh, from successful ex-offenders, which is something that um, we've been very proud to uh, implement uh, within the reentry um, formula is to have successful ex-offenders involved as mentors to help guide others through the reentry process. And in Connecticut, um, after you're released, after three years, if you're off parole or probation, uh, they will allow you uh, to go back in and participate in volunteer and contracted uh, programs if you're employed by one. And then number four, involvement of the entire family uh, heals, inspires, and sustains change. Very, infor very important to have an environment that promotes uh, a holistic approach of getting the whole family involved. This program in particular uh, was a three-year grant uh, for Second Chance Mentoring Act, which uh, was to serve young fathers from the ages of uh, 18 to 24, uh, providing them with uh, fatherhood services, mentoring services, and also uh, comprehensive reentry case management services. The goals were to strengthen family, enhance the quality of life for the children by enhancing the quality of life and educating and providing a successful reentry and resources for the parent as they leave incarceration and return to the community, and then overall attempting to reduce uh, recidivism. According to the Yale study, uh, family entry uh, recidivism rate is half of that of the state based on the clients that uh, family entry comes into contact with. Client engagement, um, pre-release. In my observation, the most important part of the client engagement and pre-release really has been in order to pique the client's interest. And this has been done by the approach that we use by getting ex-offenders involved in the process. So myself, being a person who was formerly incarcerated, what I've learned from my personal experience and then my professional experience acting in this capacity, that it's very difficult to communicate with someone if you can't make the connection. It's just like having a telephone. You know, the telephone is not going to work if you don't make the connection. So if you have information for someone, it's going to be hard to distribute that information to them if you don't make the connection. So the connection is very important. I think this is where the role of a successful ex-offenders being involved in the reentry process is important, especially upon initial contact. Um, 
this allows uh, the person that you come into contact with to break down those barriers, those walls of resistance, where they're open to even receive information based on the fact that just seeing you and knowing your experience, that you provide them with uh, some hope, some inspiration, and the possibility that they may be able to also implement change in their own lives. And this is very important in order to get people to the contemplative stage of change, to begin even contemplating change, and then get them involved in the process. Upon uh, client engagement pre-release, naturally there's an intake uh, criminogenic needs assessment. We use the LSIR, which is level of service inventory, uh, to determine what has to be done for the individual, uh, help them design a treatment plan that they participate in, what are their reentry goals, uh, what are their fatherhood goals, uh, what does their reentry plan look like, and this is all done based on the self-reporting tools that we use, that you know, the information that they elicit to us. And the first thing we tell them, because we know that a lot of the guys have been involved in contact with the system uh, on most, most occasions, not their first time, and they could be resistant to providing information. So we tell them it's just like going to the doctor. You know, if your ankle is bothering you and I ask you what's wrong, if I'm the doctor, I can't help you if you tell me that your elbow is bothering you. It's very important that you pinpoint what your issues are and then we can design a treatment plan that can help you address those issues. So the communication, once again, is, uh, is very important. Uh, then there's a fatherhood curriculum that's implemented and that's um, inside out dad, also 24-7 dad, a hybrid that's created because of the age group. Uh, then there's perpetual groups that go on until the client is released into the community. And then the client file is transferred to the case manager for development of the specified detailed reentry plan. Uh, client engagement post-release. Uh, the client engagement post-release, uh, there's a number of things that take place. Um, what we've noticed is that the clients that get out and they initiate contact with the team members and the mentor, they seem to do better in the community because they initiated the contact. And just being quite frank with you, for the clients that we do have to chase down to continue the process of engagement post-release, unfortunately some of those clients don't do well. But the good thing is that we notice that it's very important with the initial contact once the community, once the, once the client hits the community, it's very, very important. And those who have done that, they seem to fare better. And once, once we make contact with the client, whether we have to contact them or they contact us, then we begin the process where they're linked back up with their mentor that they met in pre-release. It may be uh, a host of things, resume preparation, uh, employment referrals to the private sector. We focus, we focus on basic needs, IDs are very important, uh, birth certificate, social security card, job search attire. Um, we may, uh, even in a couple of cases, we have uh, those who are interested, we help assist them with obtaining their license, we help to pay for it. Occupational uh, self safety health administration OSHA training, uh, we get them involved with that. There's some that are offered for free, there's some that we uh, pay for those uh, gentlemen who are interested in going into construction, uh, any uh, building trade or anything of that nature. Uh, we have them registered with Selective Service. So then once they register with Selective Service, there's, um, there's grants that they can receive for vocational services. Uh, if they want to drive CDL, if they want to become a barber, uh, they must be registered for Selective Service in order to obtain the Workers' Investment Act grant, which is the WEIR grant. And we make referrals for adult education. We have a di diaper bank for children. And then most of all, we have a 24-7 support line where they can call any of the team members anytime if they're going through some situations, which we, ha we have had many that I can't, there's not enough time to discuss um, over the webinar, but uh, some gentlemen may call you 12 o'clock and, and they don't want to make a bad decision. And, and that line is always open for one of us to answer to be able to try to um, conduct an intervention and walk them through the process where they won't hurt themselves or hurt their family in the process by getting rearrested or, or something of that nature. And then uh, client engagement post-release, uh, the peer mentors are heavily involved um, and help them navigate a successful reentry in the community. A lot of the gentlemen who are their mentors have experienced some of the reentry hurdles 
that you experience upon uh, re-entering the community. And those gentlemen help walk them through it. They help guide. They help guide them through the process. Um, they talk to them about a lot of things that these young men probably wouldn't talk to anyone else about. They develop a relationship pre-release. They have a trust in them, and, and it's very important going forward to have that uh, once again that support system. Uh, we also the case management uh, team. They make uh, social referral social service referrals for the co-parent or the primary caregiver. So it's also services provided for the co-parent um, to send out referrals for social services and things of that nature. Um, the family participates uh, in community cultural enrichment events for dads and families. Sometimes we have trips on the holidays. We do the present uh, giveaway, the toy drives, and things of that nature. And we also have the uh, family dinner with um, the dads and the children and, and the co-parent if they're still involved or they want to attend. Uh, client and co-parent participation in post release fatherhood survey. So once we get near the end of the program, uh, the clients stay on with kind of like an aftercare process, but we have them fill out the fatherhood survey to assess their fatherhood skills since they went through uh, the program and compare that with the initial fatherhood skills survey that they took upon entrance into the program. And this is the contact information uh, here on the screen uh, where my email is provided um, and family entry. Once again, our logo is at the bottom. So in closing, um, the only thing I want to say is that uh, there, there's a narrative that isn't often told uh, throughout reentry circles on a national level and also in fatherhood slash reentry circles. But I think that it is good to note that it is very important and it's almost crucial to have uh, people who were formerly incarcerated that are living successful, positive, productive lives involved in the reentry process uh, to be able to make the initial connection, communicate in order for the person to receive the services and receive even the information that would allow them to make a change in their life and give them hope and inspiration in their life. And I think that story needs to be told more often. And I believe there's a lot of uh, men and women around the country who are involved in this process, but it's just a story that is often not told. And I thank you, and I hope the information I provided today was helpful to um, to someone that's listening. Thank you, and have a great day. Well, thanks, Daya. Yeah, that was great, and, and thanks for really emphasizing that at the end there, yeah. So um, we've now got um, a nice chunk of time, and I, I really um, appreciate the presenters um, keeping their um, presentation short. We, we put them on a tight leash this time, so we've got a bit more time to have this um, conversation over the over the final half hour here, really. Um, now, um, as I mentioned, we've been joined by um, Robert Duggins, who's um, at the program there with um, Darren. And um, do we also have um, Geraldo Hernandez on the line? Have you been able to join us yet, Geraldo? Yes, I'm here. Great. Well, welcome. And I really appreciate I believe you're calling from your workplace? Yes. Wow. Well, I, I appreciate you taking the time. Thank you very much, sir. So what I'd like to do here is, is first of all, just give um, Robert and Geraldo um, an opportunity just to introduce themselves and tell them and, and tell us a little bit about their story. And then um, I've got quite a few questions that have already come in for Darren and Jocelyn. I, I've not looked at all the questions yet, and I'm sure there's more for Dai as well. Um, so we probably won't be able to get to everything, but we'll do our best. Um, so having said that, if I could um, first of all ask, um, I think we've, we've got the names wrong on the slide I'm looking at. It should be um, Geraldo is actually representing the family reentry program. And Dontre, who's also with family reentry, was um, not able to make it today. So um, Geraldo um, has stepped into him at the last minute. We appreciate that, Geraldo. The, the father who is representing strength in families is Robert Duggins. Um, so, Robert, I, I apologize that we haven't got your name on the screen here, but um, can I just start with you and ask you to tell us a, just a little bit about your story, you know, so, um, how many children you have, what your relationship is like with the mother, and um, how did you get involved in this program? 
Um, well, first I want to say thank you guys for having me. Uh, my name is Robert Guggins. Uh, I have a nine-year-old little girl. Her name is Mackenzie. Um, I don't have any contact with her mother. My daughter, my family and I have full custody of my daughter. My daughter lives with uh, my mom and dad. They are my co-parents. Um, I've been incarcerated in Washington State for almost seven years now. Um, I've been involved in the Strength and Families program for about a year. Um, I've completed the Walking the Line portion and the Parenting Inside Out. Uh, right now, currently, I'm a uh, peer mentor or a teacher's assistant, uh, assisting the program coordinator dealing with uh, teaching classes and stuff like that. Um, yeah, uh, I really enjoy this program and what it has to offer for us in Washington State. I was involved prior to this with a Long Distance Dads program, which was a peer-based class that was taught by uh, offenders in Washington. Once that program became uh, muted in Washington, uh, Strength and Family stepped in, and uh, I've been involved with this as long as I've been in WCC, the institution that I'm currently at now. Okay, well, I, I certainly hope that you um, are able to return to the community soon. I know in talking with Darren that your date is coming up sometime this year. Um, could you just say a, a little bit about um, what challenges you, you are anticipating and how you're feeling about the, the day when you actually get to get out of there? Um, yeah, I, I release in December. Um, uh, I've been able to work with my program coordinator or in the uh, navigators to tackle most of the problems that I'm going to be facing. Uh, you know, a big thing that I see with people in Washington State is being able to uh, deal with three different obstacles: is housing, uh, transportation, and employment. And uh, with our program, there's a lot of focus on those three fields because those are the biggest downfalls with people that are transitioning out of prison back into society. Um, for myself, uh, I mean, I have a huge support network, not only with my family, but with people that I've came in contact with throughout my time in DOC. So I have employment lined up for myself. Uh, while I was in prison, I was able to get my uh, AWS, my welding certifications, so that I can have a job lined up. Uh, our program in Washington has uh, different unions that are local throughout the state come down here and speak and uh, they can get you set up to get all your union dues paid for, uh, get a step right into uh, a job pretty much right when you get out. And then with housing, uh, as for myself, I don't have community custody when I release. So with Washington State, if you don't have community custody, you don't qualify for uh, housing voucher programs, which is to be able to help you three months uh, with rent and stuff like that with a DOC transitional approved housing. Uh, I don't qualify for that, but my situation is different. Uh, like I said, I have support. Um, I have a home to go to when I get out. Um, but if I didn't have that, it would be a big barrier for myself would be housing. And uh, But besides that, uh, everything is looking up in the right direction. I've had a time to be able to create a transition plan so that I can have a, a written down plan pretty much of what I need to do to make sure that my transition is successful. So as long as my values reflect what my goals are, I should be able to accomplish each step one at a time. So. Okay. Well, we certainly wish you all the best. and. Um We'll have more questions for you before we're done, I'm, I'm sure, Robert. And I encourage everybody to um, send in questions for either Robert um, or Geraldo, and you know, or you know, a, a general question for what it's been like for them in this program. So let me um, ask you, Geraldo, to, to do the same thing that Robert just did. Um, if you could just tell us a little bit about yourself, um, you know, your kids, um, relationship with the mother, um, and ha how you got involved in the in the program with DIE? Well, first off, let me start by saying thank you to everybody for having me on last minute. Uh, my name is Geraldo Hernandez. I have three-year-old twin boys. 
I came across the Family Reentry Program as well as the GBAP Teen Fatherhood Program during my time I spent in Manson Youth Institute. It was at which time I met Dai, and he introduced me to what the program is about. He let me know the type of off helps that they suggest. It was, for me at the time, was just a weekly way to get out of my cell. The more that I attended the program, the more that I got into it, the more that I learned how to be a better person, a better father, and how to continue the skills that they're teaching me and apply them into the real life world. I was later than released on transitional supervision. Dai reached out to me immediately. Um, he helped me every step of the way. Um, they helped me get my life in order. They helped me pick up financially, helped with my kids. They come, gave me the most important advice that I, I feel that they gave me was the advice and emotional support because as someone who was raised without a father to have somebody else there constantly telling me, hey, I'm here to help you, whether it be you're stressed out and you need somebody to talk to, you need a ride to an interview, or you just want to hang out with somebody and get to unwind. They were there in all those ways. And to me, that that's, that's the best type of help you can offer somebody who comes from a background with no emotional support. So I was then later intrigued in returning to school. Dai gave me a few options. You know, they helped me out in the best course of action to take. I later on enrolled myself in Porter and Chester Institute, where I attended for nine months um, taking up dental assisting. I was later hired straight from my externship site, which I am still here to this day. In the process of that, I also managed to get into a restaurant part-time. I worked my way up the ladder. I am currently also a sous chef, aside from a dental assistant. Even so, to this day, even aside from all my success, I still get calls from Dai and from other mentors in the program checking up on me, making sure I'm okay, asking if I need any help. To this day, I call them personally because I fell in love with the work that they do. I fell in love with the people who are in the program, and I wanted to give back. I still want to give back. I constantly call to see if there's any way I can help, anything I can do, because the program helped me out. It changed my life. And I can honestly say I would not be the man I am today without this program. So in, if I can help, I'm there. I just want to repay what was paid towards me and help others out and continue the cycle. Well, I don't know if you're um, on the computer as well, Geraldo. Are, are you just calling in on the phone? Yes, I'm only over the phone. I'm currently at yeah. work. Yeah, well, let me just tell you that on, on the computer screen, you know, we've been showing presenter slides and there's a chat box that the attendees, there's um, about 200 people on the line here who are, who are listening to you and um, a lot of people are writing in here things like now about very inspiring, awesome, congratulations. So you've um, certainly hit a, hit a nerve with the, the folk here. I, I wasn't watching when the public was talking. I, not sure what the chat was then, but um, and I, I was very touched by the fact that you used the word love there because um, I've often, in, in doing this work, we will often involve um, fathers in panel presentations to tell us, um, you know, about their experiences in the program. And I often ask um, guys, um, what was the thing that really kept you involved in this program? You know, what was it about this program that was special? And invariably, people use the word love like you just did because I think that's what guys get out of being in this kind of atmosphere where you are, you know, being totally supported in a way that may not happen before, right? So um, really appreciate you sharing that. Um, let me circle back now to um, the presenters and ask a few of the questions that have been coming in and then we'll, we'll get back to the dads for, um, for a few more comments. And, um, and we really do have a lot of questions. I, I'm trying to digest them all here. So um, Apologies if I um, 
take a while on this, but mm -hmm. let me pose a couple of questions for Darren here. Um, so um, somebody asked Darren um, if you could give any incentives to stay engaged um, for the guys pre-release. Yeah, uh, one of them on the uh, those the video visits. That's one of the incentives that we get. Um, and again, that's not for everybody. Um, but prior to release, what we're really looking for is, um, to be quite honest, Nigel, we want their their families and their kids to be the incentives. So um, we're really trying to cultivate an atmosphere where uh, you know guys can go do a lot of things while they're in prison. Some of them not very good. Um, and, you know, we want guys who want to put their families first. And a lot of guys, uh, maybe Mr. Duggins can even speak to this, will give up other paying jobs or working in industries and different things that, that might seem more meaningful, uh, but they want to put their kids and their families first. And, and we, we like to focus on that being the incentive. Wow. Yeah, perhaps we'll, Robert would like to chime in on that then, yeah? Yeah, well, so I'm the only peer mentor for the institution that I'm at right now, currently. Um, but like what I say with a lot of the people, uh, I challenge them because in our program they offer like uh, you can only miss two classes to be able to graduate the program. But I challenge everyone in the program to stay and not miss out on that because in my vision or the relationship that I have with my child is that she deserves the opportunity for me to be there for her and to apply the things that I learned in this class into the relationship that we have. Uh, you know, the relationship with my daughter is amazing uh, compared to what some people might see. Uh, because I am incarcerated, uh, my daughter and I still talk on the phone daily. Um, I'm involved in parent-teacher conferences with her school. Um, I talk to her dance instructors, my mom, and uh, you know, the negative relationships that I created by becoming incarcerated have all changed to positive and healthy, supportive relationships because I apply the things that I learned in the class and everyone around me, including the people that are incarcerated with me, feed off the energy that I'm able to provide because they can see that uh, the positive change that's happening in my life and slowly the things that happen in their lives too. Well, yeah, I think you said you, you, said you fit inside. I'm sorry, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, I was saying it's an incentive in itself to, uh, you know, be able to have people in your family uh, and the, the peers around you be able to support the decisions that you make because in prison, uh, everything is judged by the actions that you create for yourself. So the actions that I carry um, with the relationship with my kid everyone in prison sees that and they all view it uh, with different aspects and uh, it, it's actually pretty great. <laughs> yeah, wow, wow, no, you're doing a great service for a lot of people by the sound of things, yeah. So I think you mentioned at the beginning that you've, um, you've been inside for seven years, right? So how long did it take you to get to this point? Um, was it the program that really triggered this or were you, also, were you already starting to make some kind of personal transitions? Well, like I said, the relationship with my kid has been an ongoing thing. Um, before Strength and Families, I was doing the Long Distance Dads program, which is pretty much a communication program on how I can maintain a relationship with my daughter through communicating over the phone and stuff. But once that was gone, um, I was at a crossroads. So, um, like I said, I don't qualify for a lot of the transitional programs that are offered in Washington State because of the actions that I had when I first got incarcerated. Um, but uh, when I came into Strength and Families, I remember Darren came in and spoke uh, saying, oh, well, you're going to have to miss certain days of work and, uh, you know, that, uh, and here um, working is our lifeline, I mean, so I was like, man, i got to miss work to take these classes that um, I feel like I'm already pretty much a good dad, uh, but I was real hesitant and standoffish. Uh, but once I broke down that barrier and got involved in this program, everything in my life has changed. Like uh, this is my second incarceration. Throughout this whole time, it's been seven years. Um, 
And, uh, you know, once I started actually doing this program, uh, you know, like I said earlier, that if my values reflect my goals, my life is going to change, but my actions have to reflect my values at the same time. So slowly learning how to prioritize what I valued was important in my life has, uh, you know, helped me change. And this program that I'm taking now has been able to help me put all my values in order. And uh, the relationship with my daughter is at the top. So being able to work on that on a daily basis and uh, being able to show people the results of that, uh, you know, it's, it's inspiring for everybody that's involved in our program. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, Robert. Yeah. So a, a couple more quick questions for you, Darren, and then I've got a couple of questions for Jocelyn. Um, so um, you've been asked, is the program in all state institutions? And um, well, let me ask you that first. So it is the program in, in all institutions in the state. I believe it's in four or five of them, right? Right, right. And it's it's in four, um, and we've got 11 facilities here, I think, men's facilities in the state. Um, but I do have the ability to move guys from one prison to the other to get them in the program, which we do. Um, it's just super complicated. There's so many things going on. And uh, Mr. Duggins is, is um, uh, you know, he we, we were trying to recruit him. He was putting in for some other programs that may have got him out a little bit earlier, um, but because he didn't, I'm not going to go into all the details, it gets kind of kind of deep, but, uh, you know, because of uh, our commitment to try to, you know, keep him in our program, uh, we just went ahead and, and went, went on with it. So he's a little, um, he went in a little bit earlier than most, um, but it's really, we're in five counties where you release, so you really... Uh, I mean, that's really the appropriate question to ask because we're only right now in just a slice of the state of Washington. Um, but if you're, say, on the east side of the mountains, if you're familiar with the geography of the state of Washington, um, and you're going to release to one of our counties and you qualify uh, at the right time, it's likely that I could probably get them into one of our facilities and put them in the program. Um, so, uh, but, so more county than prison, I would say, is, is really right now those are the limitations. Okay, great. And somebody else had asked if the reform program is um, something that's national, so I, I can actually answer that because I, I believe there are five um, programs around the country that have this Office of Family Assistance funding, you know, to, to, to do the actual reform program, although they all are slightly different. Um, and there are other right. programs uh, working in various facilities around the country, but it's not something that is everywhere by any means. Um, and I also believe, Darren, that you have done this work with female inmates as well. Right? Are there any current programs going on in Washington State? Yeah, there's a lot of. Yeah, there is. There's a lot of um, parenting type programs. In fact, in uh, the female facility, uh, like the rest of the state, we have Parenting Inside Out, and that's the curriculum that we use as a component of our program. Um, but they don't have the resources and all the, the staff that, uh, that this program has. And I think one of the things, uh, Nigel, that I just want to emphasize is um, it is culture changing in terms of a prison when um, you establish some things, you get the right guys in, uh, but then once you've had a few groups go through, uh, the, best, uh, the best marketing that you can have is a word of mouth of the past participants. Um, telling some of their peers what they've what they've gotten out of the program. Interesting, yeah, and we find that in the community as well as inside, I think. But yeah, okay. A, a, a couple of questions for you, Jocelyn. Um, are you aware of any strategies that might help increase a custodial parent's willingness to participate in a family-oriented support program? Are you, you know the the parent in the community any strategies to to help them get involved? Uh, specific to custodial parents, um, or did you? Can you say the question again? I'm sorry. Is it? Is well, it yeah. The, the question, question was custodial parent. I, I think basically they're talking about family in the community. You know. Yeah. So w what I've seen is programs take a number of different strategies to try and increase family involvement. Um, so it can be as part of the its core to the central program strategy in having 
um, some sort of curriculum or activity that's intended for families, so not just the formerly incarcerated person, but whoever their um, romantic or intimate partner is um, or their co-parent um, in doing some sort of um, a healthy relationship um, or healthy marriage um, curriculum. And I think one of the other presenters spoke to that as well, some like relationship um, building um, activities. There's also, we've seen family activity days um, or sort of special events in which um, the formerly incarcerated program participant is intended to bring um, somebody that's in their family to the activity and it's and it's focused on you know family engagement so you know um, we've seen programs do uh, things for like Father's Day we've seen them do um, uh, baby showers I've seen um, sports outings um, uh, cookouts that sort of thing um, which are intended yeah to, to uh, facilitate more more bonding uh, for the family members uh, together. Um, dinners, um, usually um, programs are able to do that successfully when they are either um, uh, paying, you know, paying for the entire activity, so paying for food, for dinner, uh, facilitating transportation, either giving folks bus cards or driving people or bringing them to certain places. Um, so usually there needs to be some sort of incentive that's involved in it or food that's provided. Uh, we've seen child care be provided in order to, to get um, um, co-parents to participate in activities. So yeah, we've seen some pretty promising strategies. Um, and also I think it's important to schedule whatever activities at a time that is um, uh, most convenient for, um, for family members to, to participate. I hope okay. that answers yeah. the question. I yeah, no, I think that was good, yeah. And we can also, you know, we can follow up in some written responses if we need to clarify anything. Um, and you, you'd also mentioned, you know, that the, the visitation in the correctional setting um, can, be, um, can be negative for some children. Um, I'm just wondering, and there's been a few questions about this, um, if, you, if you can offer any tips to, to work around that. Is there any research that shows... Um, yeah. How the, um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. yeah, so what we've seen is, um, so just, you know, full stop, correctional institutions are not very welcoming places, right? They weren't designed to be welcoming, um, uh, period, um, but certainly not for, for children, um, particularly very young ones. So, um, you know, what I'm going to say is really trying to minimize what can be stressful, but it doesn't make it not stressful at all or, or a happy experience, but it's really trying to make some, mitigate the impact or the harm that um, uh, the correctional environment and being there and, and feeling it um, might, might um, uh, how that might um, uh, feel to children. Um, but what we've seen is um, program staff that either, so before a visit, um, coach uh, children and caregivers and parents about what's going to happen. So, um, and I can't say that this has been um, evaluated as being um, um, impactful, but um, it's one of those, like, this sounds like a, it's a smart thing to do. Um, anecdotal evidence suggests that um, program staff feel like it's a good thing and children and families appreciate it as well. So just telling children and uh, co-parents about what they're about to experience. So saying, we are going to go here and this is what you can experience. You will get, um, you will have to, you know, remove this. You won't be able to take this into the facility. There may be uh, dogs. Um, uh, we will then get on a bus. Um, you'll only be able to touch your family member for X amount of time. So sort of just ex describing and explaining um, what the experience is going to be like, um, we've heard as being a good practice. And then also su supporting um, the child and the caregiver or co-parent after the visit. So just trying to debrief with them about how was the experience, what are you feeling about that. So um, we've called this sort of, and we've, we've also seen um, uh, practitioners do this for phone calls as well um, to really just um, trying to help folks along and then also providing, you know, debriefing um, services following to try and 
you know, allow people an outlet to sort of talk about what they experienced um, um, and uh, get them around any sort of like feelings that they're both positive or negative that they're feeling um, uh, just to support them. So that's one thing uh, that I can offer. But on the, the other side too, I mean, we've seen correctional facilities that are trying to make the space more family friendly and I, you know, I, I, I don't feel comfortable saying that, you know, there's prisons and jails and stuff that are like totally welcoming they, but to families and children, but they can be better. And so, you know, having a wing of a, of a visiting space um, be outfitted with um, tool, uh, toys and books and um, paintings, that sort of thing that, um, you know, children can, um, that they have activities and outlets and stuff, that, that can be um, a, a good practice. Um, and we're seeing more facilities that are, are doing, doing that sort of thing. Okay, great. Um, we've got a load of questions here. This has obviously been a, a very stimulating webinar, so I will, I will ask the presenters to um, respond to the ones we, we haven't been able to get to. Uh, let me come back to you, Dai, for a um, couple of quick questions. Um, somebody is wondering who operates your 24-7 call line? Are, are they answered by the staff or by the peer mentors or by both? Um, as staff members, uh, we have um, uh, job cell phones, so they're on 24/7. We answer them, and then the, and then the mentors they have their own cell phones, which of course they provide the number to the mentees, and um, they're on 24/7. So um, that's not something that's that's paid for by the agency as far as answering 24/7. That's just something that we all do because we feel committed to what we do and to the process. Okay. And somebody else asked if the um, if the peer mentors are employees, do they get paid? No, the the the, the peer mentors they do they do receive um, a stipend, but they don't get a regular full time paycheck. But they do receive a stipend. But the hours that they put in is is well above what the stipend they receive. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. So let me circle back to um, Geraldo and. Um, Somebody's asked if um, well, what kind of support you had from your family before you were released to Aldo. Could you talk about that a little bit? Well, as far as my family, I am one of seven grandchildren who were raised by a already well over 50 grandmother. Both of my parents weren't really around. So besides my grandmother, I didn't really have much family support. I kind of had to carve my own way. That's one of the reasons why I took so, I became so fond of the program because of all the financial and, well, not financial, my apologies, all the emotional support that they provided. And to kind of build off of the question you asked, Dai, I will, there was never a time where I could not reach him or one of the other mentors. There was always some type of way where I can get in contact with them. So, but as far okay. as my family support, I had little to none prior to the program. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you've been able to make your way anyway then. Yeah. So, um, let me just ask you finally, um, Geraldo, um, if you could give tips to um, other young men um, who, who are currently incarcerated, what would you advise them about preparing for their return? As far as preparing them to enter the real world, my best advice would be the same one that was given to me. Be patient, stay focused. Everything will come in due time. As long as the focus is there and the hard work is being put in, the world is your canvas. I like it. I like it. Yeah. Well, we are getting tight on time. Um, I'm not sure if our Office of Family Assistance um, representative, um, John Allen, is, is still on the line. Are you there, John? Yes, I am. Okay. Would you like to say a few words? Yes, yes. I just want to thank everyone for attending this call. I want to thank the presenters so much for in providing information to inform the field and build upon practice 
which is so much the importance of these webinars. I want to thank the Clinton House for bringing up a great topic to really um, canvas our practice, research, and the fathers with the understanding of this practice around reentry. Fathers for taking the time out to come out and provide your stories into overcome the obstacles in the line. Thank you very much, everyone, and especially to the presenters in today's webinar. I really appreciate you providing the nuggets to very okay, much. Thank you, John. Yeah. Thank you, John. And um, I'd like to let everybody know that we are actually in the process of um, developing a virtual community. Um, we're, we're not there yet, and, um, but I think we're going to get there eventually, and oh, I'm sure we're going to get there eventually. And one of the ideas of that is that we want to be able to continue these kind of conversations in a virtual space. So we will follow up um, with everybody who's on this webinar um, if and when we'll, get, we'll be able to get that going, which I think will be sometime this summer. Um, and um, you know, I see that there's a lot of interest here. We will ask the presenters to respond to questions that we've not been able to get to, and they'll be posted probably in the next, in the next month. And you can come back to our website of fatherhood.gov um, and um, backslash webinars and um, see that. Um, I would just like to give the presenters one chance and the fathers to, to leave us with just one final thought. It's going to be very quick because we are over time. Um, so let me start with um, Darren. Have you got any um, one sentence um, bit of wisdom that you'd like to close with? It's, it's complicated work. I would say that that's one thing to always remember. Not one situation is ever the same. And I like to tell, you know, our guys, it's just, you know, prepare for the unexpected. Have contingency plans, and um, you're, you're uh, likely to be successful if you work hard. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll come back to you, Robert. Um, Jocelyn, word of wisdom for us? Sure. Um, this isn't intended as a disagreement of what the folks just said, but there's also the need for systemic reform. So um, I appreciate the comments about um, individual men who are returning, working hard, and trying as best as they could and staying focused, but there's also the need for reform of uh, policy and practice among, uh, you know, uh, of systems uh, that are really critical to, to supporting fathers and their families. So I don't want us to take our eye off of that ball, too. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. And one of the questions that we didn't get to that I, I will, will ask you all to respond to in writing is um, concerning how you deal with the, um, the attitudes and policies of various correctional institutions in terms of getting these programs going. We didn't have time to talk about that. Um, Dai, uh, a final word. Uh, yes, uh, thank you again, Nigel, and, and also the listening audience for having me. And I just want to say um, to any um, formerly incarcerated people that are on the line, um, it's very important to know that you're very important. You're someone's father, you're someone's mother, and that child really needs you present in their life. And I just want to say going forward and making decisions, please think about outcome and just play the tape forward. Always fast forward the tape before you make a decision and continue to uh, stay solid and consistent in your children's life. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, and, I, and I thank all the presenters one more time. You did a fantastic job. And, and I particularly want to thank um, Robert and Geraldo for joining us and sharing um, their words. And I do want to give each of them just a chance to leave us with one, one more thought. So Geraldo, and then I'll come back to Robert, for the final comment. I just want to say thank you for giving me the time and opportunity to share my story with you. Hopefully it inspires somebody else going forward and it changes their life for the better. I appreciate all the work that all of you guys do for people like me and people in our situation. And any way that I can help progress programs like this so that they can continue to help others, I am more than willing to thank you very much for all the work you guys do. You are the key. Okay, thank you, Araldo. 
So Robert, you get the final word. Um, and again, I apologize that your name wasn't on the slide before this, but it will be when we post them for, for, for real. All right, thank you guys. Uh, thank you for having me, uh, inviting me to do this. Uh, I really appreciate it. And uh, thank you guys for all the work that you guys put in. Uh, you guys are giving me and uh, my daughter a due service. You guys are helping me gain the tools to uh, be the father that my daughter deserves to have in her life. And uh, I appreciate all the work you guys are doing. Okay, well, thank you. Thank everybody. Um, again, I encourage you all to check back at our website, um, fatherhood.gov backslash um, webinars and in, um, in the next four to six weeks, and you'll be able to see um, all the materials from this. You'll be able to listen to the webinar again if you want to. You can, you can see the um, transcript. And um, while you've still got your screen on, you can still download the slides and any of the resources um, from the box that you're seeing. And um, I appreciate your time today. I'm sorry we went a little bit over, but I, I think you'll agree with me. It was well worth hearing from everybody. And um, you will receive an evaluation link. Please complete that to help us continue to make these webinars good and, and meet your needs. I wish everybody a good day. Thank you very much.